Hey everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for our April installment of the History Speaker Series. Um, we're very glad that you're able to join us tonight here on Zoom. Uh, so uh, firstly, before we go any further, I would like to thank a couple of individuals for making these events possible month after month. Um, the first person is Phil Jackman, who does our amazing posters that you see. And the other person is Marianne Grant, uh, who is part of our history committee and who uh, does all the behind the scenes to make this event possible. So thank you very much to both of them. Um, I'm going to introduce those of us who are on screen now, and uh, hopefully Judy will be joining us on screen here momentarily. Um, I have Monica, who hey, oh, I have Monica, who is running the Zoom this evening. Many of you will know her name from interacting with her uh, during your registration. I have Janet with us as well, who is our history committee representative this, this evening. Um, I am the history programming coordinator at OMA. My name is Lindsay, and I have our wonderful speaker with us as well, who it is my pleasure to be able to introduce tonight. So we have Judy Humphreys with us. Um, Judy taught high school English in Brockville, Toronto, and Gravenhurst. And after eight years raising children at home, Judy accepted the offer to open a library for the Office of the Fire Marshal at the Ontario Fire College. She spent the next 20 years there as a research librarian before retiring in 2012, and thus began what I love that you termed as your volunteer career. Uh, which included work at the Gravenhurst Archives, becoming the head of the archives in 2015. And this spawned Judy's commitment to sharing the stories of World War I soldiers from in and around our area, um, which I understand you plan to publish at some point, and of course have featured in uh, Judy's very popular talks. Uh, so with that, I'm very pleased to hand it over to Judy Humphreys for her talk. Thank you so much, Judy. Take it away. Thanks, Lindsay. I appreciate the invitation to speak tonight and welcome to everyone with an interest in the history of not only Gravenhurst, but the history of prisoner of war camps and of the soldiers of the First and Second World War. So let's begin. Well, folks, it is June of 1940. And we're standing flabbergasted for more reasons than one at the main downtown intersection of an Ontario town. These are German prisoners of war entering our town somewhere in Ontario, but I'm unable to tell you the location of this town at this time. The allied powers have called for complete silence on the location of POWs being held by allies. Let us set the stage for this unusual moment in history by going back to see what has brought us here to this intersection in some unknown town. War has been declared by our allies following the invasion of one country after another by Hitler's German troops. The Fuhrer Directive number 16 was released on the 16th of July, 1940, although its contents had been well understood by the Wehrmacht well before this. The directive called for the invasion of Britain and was known as Operation Sea Lion. You can see how short that distance is between the European coast and the United Kingdom. It was immediately clear that prisoners taken by the Allies would not be able to be left in Britain. Should Hitler's forces suddenly invade Britain, a ready-made army would be waiting there for them, waiting to be released into action in England. And with the increasing shortage of food that the British would finally experience, they would not be able to feed the countless prisoners of war that they would be taking. So what to do with thousands of prisoners of war? On June the 10th, 1940, Canada's War Cabinet agreed to take prisoners of war for internment in Canada. The Canadian government had been searching Canada for a while for vacant places where they could create prisoner of war camps. One that became obvious was the former Calador Sanatorium, located on Lake Muskoka in Gravenhurst, Ontario. 
built originally to treat wealthier TB patients who could afford to pay for their um, more than luxurious upkeep. By 1935, it had been closed and has now been sitting vacant and abandoned for five years. As soon as the uh, Canadian government stumbled on this property and thought, aha, here we are, immediately a message was sent to the Canadian government that the first shipment of prisoners of war would be arriving in Gravenhurst in Ontario in 20 days. The red box on the map shows where these POWs would be located and the message was clear. Get Camp Calador ready for its new occupants. How to change a 25 year old sanatorium into a prisoner of war camp in approximately 15 days. Well, the Royal Canadian Engineers and about 185 civilian tradesmen were brought in and were given the task of transforming that, that 25 year old abandoned sanatorium uh, into a functioning prisoner of war camp. In no particular order, they had to deal with or construct new water lines, new sewage systems, heating plants, storage for coal and wood, renovation of the main building for officers, erecting a 10 foot high steel fence with barbed wire across the top, guard towers at every corner so that all areas would be covered by two, sentry posts on the ground, accommodation for all the other ranks, kitchens with equipment, beds to be built, administration buildings, accommodations for administration, accommodations for the Veterans Guard of Canada who would live on site, and eventually classrooms, libraries, and mess halls. Nothing to it, 15 days. Right from the start, it must have been very clear what a nightmare it would be to administer a prisoner of war camp. Many layers of British and Canadian government would be looking over the shoulders of the administration in that camp and would be involved in administering it. And you can see all the layers that are there. And that's just the beginning. Beyond all those layers of administration imposed from on high, we finally reach the man in charge. He's the man where the rubber meets the road, the camp commandant. He was in charge of everything to do with the leaders of various groups reporting to him all the way through. Most important, he would have to apply the rules of the Geneva Convention of 1929, which would be in fact the, um, what will we call them, the, the absolute um, e um, emphasis for administration of a prisoner of war camp. But that's not all. Inspecting, checking, directing, and so on would be three other groups. And they would have um, some say in the implementation of those rules of the Geneva Convention and in the administration of the camp itself. Uh, the Swiss consulate in Canada would be sending consular reps to inspect the camp and to note any complaints under the Geneva Conventions. The International Committee of the Red Cross would also be visiting regularly and would be helping to maintain some kind of communication between prisoners of war and their families back home in Germany. And the YMCA would not only be inspecting the operation, but would also provide all kinds of um, leadership in terms of education, culture, spirituality, recreation, all of those things. In other words, <clears throat> excuse me, they would be supplying the resources. Another layer <laughs> to look at, this poor man, the camp commandant, would also have the Veterans Guard of Canada and their commanding officer reporting to him. He had an administration staff that was almost equal to the administration staff for the commandant. Um, he took over on the 15th of August, 1940. They would be responsible for all of the guard duties, um, preventing escapes, maintaining order and discipline. And of course, being Canadian or uh, in the best British tradition, they would be unarmed. There would be one company of veterans guards with four platoons, approximately 211 guards for two months at any given time in camp. So in other words, they would be there strictly living right in the camp, not going anywhere else but camp for two months. They would be sent away for one month of training and rest, and then they would be transferred to a different camp, and all that training would have to start over because every camp would be wildly different one from the next. And as if that wasn't enough, there are those veterans guards standing uh, 
with the HQ in the background, the transportation camp is right on the, the left there. And that's just one platoon that you're looking at there. You can begin to see a bit of another platoon uh, behind them on the right. So uh, you'd have your four platoons out there. But there was another whole layer. Enemy combatants had their own layer of military administration to deal with. Poor old camp commandant got these guys as well. The German POWs had their own camp leader, or Lagenführer, who was a senior German officer in the camp. He too had a staff, which included German officers, who would be placed in charge of the various things that they would be doing, kitchen, sports activities, um, educating the POWs, uh, dissemination of mail and parcels, and so on. The Lagenführer would receive all the complaints and all the requests from the prisoners of war. He would take a look at them, try to solve the problems that he could. If he couldn't solve the problems, they would go, in fact, to the camp commandant. Um, this Lagenführer had another little role as well. He would sit on the escape committee, which heard all the proposals for escapes, weigh the pros and cons of each, and then chose the ones that would go ahead. This is Lagenführer Lieutenant Colonel Mayenthaler. You see here a Nazi officer who's trying his very best to look his very best, and he's not being very successful. The pants give away the fact that he does not have a complete uniform, although one will probably arrive for him from Germany once he makes the request. Uh, but right now, he's not looking his very, very best. I'm probably a little embarrassed. So here we are, June the 30th, 1940, back at the intersection of uh, two streets in some town which has not been named. <laughs> um, and there are 476 enemy combatants arriving by train at Gravenhurst. These POWs would be marched through the town from the station to the camp. No photographs would be allowed to be taken so that no hint of a location could be given which would create targets for Nazi sympathizers. And there were lots of those in the United States. And they were very afraid that the American Nazi sympathizers might very well try to stage some sort of a little coup wherever there was a POW camp and maybe try to liberate some of the, of the uh, men there. So there would be no references in the press to where this prisoner of war camp would be. Having said that, the iconic photograph on the right was printed on the front page of the Toronto Star the day after it was taken. It carried no byline and no location, but it did show in fact enough information that anyone who was a seasonal resident, a cottager, a tourist, whatever, or a resident of Gravenhurst would in fact discover that these prisoners of war were being lodged in town. The young guards that you see here um, were actually members of Lord Strathcorna's horse. They would be heading off to the front very shortly as soon as in August, the Veterans Guard took over. Looking as arrogant and superior as they possibly could, the German officers and other ranks marched on through the streets, all 476 of them. And everywhere the people lined the streets and they were either silent or they stood there hissing. How many of them had loved ones in Europe fighting in the war there? How they must have hated the sight of these German soldiers marching through their town. And how many would have been afraid for themselves and for their children of what might come of having 400 and more Germans in their midst. This is an actual diagram drawn um, uh, from, uh, actually drawn by members of not only the um, prisoners of war, but also from the Veterans Guard. So it's a drawing that is quite accurate of what the uh, prisoner of war camp looked like. The exterior line that you see around, kind of generally around the outside is called the camp enclosure, uh, sorry, is called um, the camp compound. And the area that you see in red is the enclosure, the area that encompassed the POW world. You see a number one in front of a curved building. That was the original Camp Calador building. And now you see how many other buildings had been erected. This actual drawing was made in about 1943. So it's not the way it was in 1940, but it was in fact the way the camp would eventually look. And you can see that veterans guard tower, sorry, that the guard towers, sentry posts and so on are all on there. 
You can see in this photograph as well that the swimming area in Lake Muskoka has been marked off as well by a chain link fence, which was attached all the way to the bottom of Lake Muskoka into the rocks. The prisoners could swim there in groups of about 30. People from town or from the resorts nearby could come and try to take a look at what was going on there. But if they came too close to the fence, they might experience a warning shot over the bow of their boat or their canoe. And maybe a loudspeaker voice coming and saying to you, you are too close to the prisoners. On the 15th of October, a huge change came to Camp Calador. Camp Calador became Camp C or Camp 20 and was now going to be designated specifically for Nazi officers only. Camp 20 would in fact, or Camp Calador or Camp C, whatever you'd like to call it, but Camp 20 now officially would still retain some other ranks besides officers, but those other ranks would be there strictly in the sort of, uh, what shall we call it, the servant capacity. They would be there um, to basically serve, um, cook for, do the laundry of, and so on, of the officers in the camp. The officers in this camp were the elite of the German military machine. Most were well-educated. Most came from well-to-do families. And by 1942, most of the new arrivals would come from Rommel's Africa Corps. These officers could not be made to work. It was not allowed under the Geneva Convention. You could make other ranks work, but you could not make officers work. You will see here how self-sufficient they could be because within their, um, their group of 400 plus officers, they had every conceivable profession, and skill perfect for keeping a camp running for self-sufficiency, for making wonderful meals. Um, they could take a cabbage and turn it into just about anything wonderful. And they were also a perfectly made skill set for escape plans. The photograph of these officers was taken by a man named Henry Fry a Gravenhurst photographer who had been given the contract to photograph POWs in groups of 10. From those photographs, they would make postcards and then provide them to prisoners and to the Red Cross to be sent to families back home, a sort of an I'm okay mom kind of a message. We have dozens of these photographs in the archives. These are early days and they're looking a little ragtag at this point. We're still in about 1941 here. And you can see that not everybody has a uniform um, befitting an officer at this point. There would soon become a more stringent application of the rules of dress in the camp, however. Prisoners would have to be in their uniform, these officers, if it was all there as it was supposed to be, and that would be supplied by Germany. But if they did not have a complete uniform, they would have to then wear a regulation camp uniform. That camp uniform would consist of a blue denim shirt, a blue denim jacket, and blue jeans. But all of these would have been altered to some degree. Material was cut out of the center back of the shirt and a red disc was sewn in. The pant legs were also suitably altered, the inside leg of one pant leg and the outside leg of the other. And as the material was cut away, you couldn't simply uh, get rid of the red because you'd have a great big uh, wide open space. This photograph shows prisoners skating in an area seemingly outside the boundaries of the compound. There's a home in the background. How could this happen? Well, to understand this freedom, we have to take a look at a privilege called parole. But it's not exactly the same sort of parole as you might understand from today's prison system. Parole in an officer's prisoner of war camp, and there was really only one at this point, and that was ours, was a privilege based on an age old concept of chivalry. We're going right back to medieval times here. An officer is a gentleman. A gentleman's word is his bond. Thus, if an officer gives his word or his parole not to try to escape during various activities, he could be trusted not to do so. So in other words, he would not try to escape if he gave his parole. How would he do that? Whoop, let's go back here for a second. Well, he could sign a book and say, I'm signing this to say, 
this is my signature. I will not try to escape while I'm out. He could promise verbally with a witness or he could hand in a block of wood that he had with his signature on it, thereby giving his promise not to try to escape during a particular activity. Once he returned, he would cross his name out of the book, report in verbally, or pick up his block of wood. And then all bets were off. And at that point, he could certainly try to escape. Officers did not require a guard to go with them off the property. Mull that over for a moment. But often took an off-duty guard as a guide since they were in areas that there were areas in Gravenhurst that were off limits. It took some getting used to for the townspeople. Stories were told of townspeople going out blueberry picking because in the days of, of uh, 1940s, there were still lots of areas that had not been built up, lots of rocks, as you can imagine, and in fact, lots of blueberries. And people would go out blueberry picking, come over a rise in the landscape or over a pile of rocks and discover two men sitting there in full Nazi uniform picking blueberries with them. Bit of a shock. Under Article 17 of the Geneva Convention, the administration of a POW camp was required to encourage as much as possible intellectual and sporting pursuits among POWs. Thus a library was opened that became better stocked every month. And you can just look at the kinds of books they had on the left-hand side. Probably the envy of any library anywhere outside of Toronto. And they could have music, so close to the German soul, of course. So music was very much encouraged. The POWs could form um, all kinds of groups. They actually formed a chamber music ensemble. They formed a jazz band, a dance band, and a symphony orchestra. On pleasant Sunday afternoons, senior German officers sat on the lawn listening to chamber ensemble while drinking tea served by those other ranks. These musical groups would have been the envy of any place north of Toronto. And besides the intellectual and the musical, there were other pursuits. You may be surprised to learn that by far the most popular activity at the camp was studying, taking courses that would better their future lives. Because once Germany had been successful, victorious, and had basically taken over much of the uh, um, first world war or world, um, they would in fact be running a, a huge amount of land, all of Europe, England, and possibly even into America. So they really wanted to keep their minds active and they wanted to prepare for leadership. There were schools and libraries in every POW camp in Canada, but ours by far the most active because these were officers used to using their minds and improving them. By July of 1941, 440 of the 476 POWs in that camp were enrolled in courses. The courses were taught either by other people in the camp, other officers, some of whom were actually teachers and um, professors, or who were specialists, scientists, and so on, and they themselves would be teaching courses. Many of them, however, signed up for correspondence courses from the University of Toronto. And uh, you, in fact, had a visiting professor from Toronto who took a leave of absence from the U of T. He was a German professor. And he would come to the camp on a regular basis and assist with their studies, answer any questions, sort of run interference with the University of Toronto. Life in camp required a delicate balance. Officers could not be forced to work, but they could volunteer to do so. Thus, a landscape designer, who was one of the officers in camp, volunteered to draw up plans to beautify Gull Lake Park with stone retaining walls, stone steps, and even a stone wharf built out into the lake with a little stone lighthouse on the end. With some modifications, these designs were presented to and accepted by the town council of Gravenhurst, and the prisoners, officers, built the structures themselves. And most of those, with the exception of that wharf and little lighthouse, most of those exist today. Other ranks could be made to work and most were very happy to do so because it was very, very boring if you weren't doing anything. So in fact, they like to keep busy. 
Officers could decide then to either engage in sports, recreational activities and study, or they could in fact volunteer to do certain kinds of things around camp. And there were sports galore. There were sports and games to be done inside, such as ping pong, bridge, chess, checkers, cards. There was tennis, volleyball, football, which was of course soccer, hockey, rugger, etc. First, the tennis court, and later a field, would be flooded in winter for skating and hockey. Teams were formed. Equipment was purchased. Another piece of land was purchased in 1943 for a sports field, and this became a center of all sports activity. And of course, in the summer, there was swimming and canoeing. But there was even more to enhance those long days of imprisonment. There were pets. <laughs> You can see here, group of officers, I would say in a fairly relaxed version of, of, um, of uniform, um, holding a couple of Scotty dogs. Pets do make a camp more homey, as you can imagine. <clears throat> and some of the pets actually increased in numbers and made a valuable contribution to dinner, as you can see on the right. The intercamp grapevine, probably the veterans guard people, soon revealed the extent to which there were pets in Camp 20. <clears throat> First, they built a fish tank and caught fish in the Hawk Rock River to stock it. And then they built cages for several types of animals. Finally, one government report suggested that, quote unquote, some POW camp in Canada even had a menagerie with a bear cub, two monkeys, Cats, dogs, rabbits, and even a small snake. Hmm. Wonder where that was. So where did all this stuff come from? The answer is in broad terms, kind of from all sorts of sources. The Canadian government was responsible for the service pay of officers, German officer POWs at an equivalent rate of the detaining country or Germany, whichever was lower. German pay was in fact lower, so at that rate, <clears throat> less a lieutenant would receive 21.26 per month. Other officers proportionately higher. Other ranks, the lower ranks, were paid by Germany, so a private could expect $6 a month, but that was cut off in 1944 when Germany wasn't doing quite so well. Article 24 of the Geneva Convention stated that no prisoner was allowed to hold cash in his possession. So all earnings were deposited in one account and credits or chits you might call them were issued to use at the canteen or from suppliers with about a thousand dollars being held back by the administration to cover any willful damage. POWs could also receive gifts from their families at home. Now those became fewer and fewer as life in Germany became tougher and tougher, but gifts from sympathetic Americans were rife. Money was always deposited, however, in that central account. But most of the items that you've seen so far came from the War Prisoners Relief Fund of the International YMCA. Keep in mind, we've been talking about an officer's camp, but what would you be able to do in a regular POW camp? Well, in a regular POW camp, the canteen would be stocked with a few groceries, some fruit and veg, um, a few soft drinks, a few cigarettes, a few toiletries, some, some beer was out at 1942. But items were pretty restricted due to wartime shortages and rationing and all that sort of thing. In 1943, the weekly allotment in a regular POW camp, this is a regular one, not ours, one chocolate bar, bottles of soft drinks, one quart of beer. The annual allotment for slippers was one pair for every three prisoners. I'm not sure how they worked that out. Um, woodworking tools were prohibited, skin lotions, hair tonic, and so on. They didn't want to be um, having people actually masquerading as somebody else. So no hair tonic or, or uh, hair dye and so on. But the reality in an officer's camp was very, very different. <clears throat> How the people of the town must have resented all the incoming goodies, instruments, sports equipment, books, unloaded by townspeople from incoming trains. 
After the war, one woman recounted how her mother had been passing the train station and walking her, this woman, as a baby in a little stroller. She saw crates of peaches being unloaded from the train and loaded into a truck for Camp 20. She hadn't seen a peach in three years, and she started to cry. So what was the reality in an officer's camp? Well, the camp commandant could veto any items requested, but generally speaking, the Loganfuhrer signed the requisition and the camp commandant countersigned it, and it went off to be ordered through the HQ. This could, in fact, work to the benefit of both sides in the camp. If problems had sprung up in relations between the POWs and the guards, a little leeway in ordering, um, a few extra things could smooth things over. An extra bar of soap, an extra shirt, a little more beer. That could all make things a little bit happier and help them in that tricky tightrope that they were walking um, in getting along. In 1940, when it all began, the request had been pretty simple. Some playing cards, some Bibles, some German books. From there, it was just a small leap to a gramophone and some records. But then they wanted a piano and some sheet music. And in 1941, it was hockey skates, sticks, pucks, volleyballs, ping pong tables, footballs, boxing gloves, and more musical instruments. By 1942, it included movies every week, German films once a month, costumes, makeup, and lighting, and curtains for theatrical performances. You can only imagine. Despite all the lavish spending habits that we've been talking about, the group bank balance really grew. You might be quite surprised to learn that the one constant on every request, no matter what list it was from month to month, on and on and on, was more space for studying. When it was determined that open balconies could be closed in and the basement space could be converted with partitions and tables, the German officers actually built all of those new classroom spaces themselves and paid for the building materials out of their fund. And then they decided to do some other things as well. But right now you can see here in front of you that they had discovered the Eaton's and Simpson's catalogs, no doubt from the veterans guards. And look at the kind of stuff they were ordering. $2,000 worth of tobacco, $833 worth of fruit, 80 cases of soft drinks, until a directive from the Department of Defense came down and said, curb the orgy of spending at Camp 20. Canteen purchases should not exceed $5,000 per month. Now that's a lot of money. The next order, however, the very next month had gone up to $8,321. So in fact, the next directive said, remove all of the catalogs and do not replace. By 1943, beer consumption was averaging a gallon per POW per month. Yikes. November of by November of 1942, they had almost $10,000 in their account. By March of 1944, they had $23,000 in their account. And so even with all those lavish spending habits, they had a new idea. Let's lease a farm and grow some food and raise some meat and have better food than we have now. And so what they discovered was that in fact, there had been a farm come available very near to the camp. It was a Passmore farm. The house had burned down. Um, the acreage was obviously still there and owned by the Passmores, but it could be leased. And so in fact, a combination of the Canadian government and the POW's money um, actually went to lease the Passmore farm. POWs uh, gave their parole or word of honor that they would not try to escape and they could then walk to the farm. And when they got there, they could do all sorts of things, one of which was to build a, a house. They built stables, they built a barn for pigs. Uh, they had 
all sorts of things, a piggery, um, a large hen house. Eventually they would have three horses and you see two of them there, Caesar and Hannibal on the left-hand side. So they had three horses, 28 pigs, 400 hens and some sheep. They studied local climate and soil conditions and began an enormous garden. The man that you see in the left-hand photograph with that dog whose name was very obviously Blackie, um, was in fact, Lieutenant Colonel Westerfeld. Now, you know, a Lieutenant Colonel is no mean rank, but he was not afraid of hard work. And if you look at the picture at the bottom right, you'll see that he is plowing in the hardest possible way. Um, he's plowing the old fashioned way with a horse, two horses and a, and a hand plow. The photo at the top right shows just some of the men who are involved in the 30 member work team that were building all of the buildings out there. Massive garden. These, most of these men had never been farmers. I mean, they were professional people, but boy, they took to agriculture with a vengeance. And that garden was enormous. It did supply their food. And so did some of the animals and so on, many of the animals as well. It turned out to be particularly helpful because of course, as food became more and more scarce and rationing became more and more intense, uh, food supplies were becoming limited. So they were growing their own food, but it's no wonder that the people of Gravenhurst referred to this as the Nazi resort. With such luxury as these folks have, would you wonder that anybody would want to escape? Well, psychologists who have been studying the effects of POW incarceration have produced a number of interesting papers. And their research suggests that although there was no duty to try to escape, everybody thinks there is, but there was no duty to try to escape. In fact, most POWs, whether theirs or ours, believe that that duty existed, even if it was not written anywhere. So in their own hearts and minds, they had a duty to escape. We've also learned that in fact, only about 20% of prisoners of war, either ours or theirs, really wanted to try to escape. And you can imagine why in Europe, our soldiers would have been in deep trouble when they escaped from a prisoner of war camp. They spoke no German in most cases. The conditions in war-torn Europe were absolutely deplorable. There was no food. The people were starving. People were turning in their own relatives, let alone POWs, um, in order to curry some favor with their captors. And because so few of our, our, our soldiers would have spoken any other languages, there'd be no way of getting any help along the way. In Canada for German POWs, the long months of winter, was a, that's, that was a real consideration. Long distances from place to place, much longer than they are in Europe, made escape also really, really difficult. Getting to the US was the big goal. If you could get to the United States before the US finally entered the war, you could get to a country where there was a lot of sympathy for you as a German POW. There were escape attempts in every prisoner of war camp. Um, and there certainly were in Gravenhurst as well. Only one POW ever made it back to Germany. He was not from Gravenhurst camp. And the sad story is that when he finally did get back to Germany, after a very long and involved route, which took him to South America, among other parts of the route, um, he got back, rejoined uh, the Air Force in, in Germany and was shot down three weeks later. There were several methods of escape to get out of a POW camp. And ours, of course, where it was, required certain specialized methods. I think the most deplorable one, perhaps, was uh, this one. Escape by tunnel. Werner Koch decided to escape on the 20th of August, 1940. POWs had been digging a tunnel ever since they'd arrived in Gravenhurst for almost two months at this point. They were planning a mass escape of about 100 men. They were setting it all up. But this guy decided to escape by himself. <laughs> he, um, he went through the tunnel and blew the whole thing for everybody else. I mean, there was not going to be anybody else using that tunnel now that he'd gone out that way. He hitchhiked to Toronto by saying that he was a Norwegian pilot, even though we did not have any Norwegian pilots in Gravenhurst yet. We hadn't yet opened Little Norway. <clears throat> he was actually given money by one of the people who picked him up, $2.50. And he continued hitchhiking all the way to Montreal, but his luck stopped there. 
a very alert prisoner, or, sorry, a veterans guard sentry stopped him at the checkpoint for one of the bridges and asked for his papers. And when he didn't have any, he was immediately arrested. The police were called and he was sent back to camp in about three days and spent the next 28 days in the guardhouse. Another method of escape, of course, was escape by vehicle. On August the 30th, only about 10 days after this guy had gone, another escape attempt was happening. This camp was still under construction, remember. Two men managed to jam a board under each of two trucks being filled with rubble and rock. They crawled in under the truck on the board and rode through the gates to freedom. One was picked up on his way hitchhiking to North Bay. Interestingly enough, by a Toronto Star reporter who'd been sent there to get the whole story about um, prisoners of war escaping. The other made it to Bala and entered a home there, um, sat down with the lady of the house who had in fact called the camp and enjoyed a cup of tea and homemade cookies before being picked up and taken back. 12 hours of freedom, 28 days in the guardhouse. And under the Geneva Convention, no further reprisals could be taken for these men. So in other words, 28 days in the guardhouse was going to be it. Mother Cray had a very strong motive for wanting to get home. He'd married his bride to be by proxy while in the camp. With distractions uh, mounted by some of his friends, he climbed into a packing case and he was loaded onto a truck and um, put onto a train in a baggage car. He was unloaded on the platform in Toronto, pushed up the lid to climb out and was caught immediately. 18 hours of freedom, 28 days in the guardhouse. Water, water everywhere. Why not try to escape using water? Two men removed the brown mattress covers from their beds and took them folded in their towels down to go swimming. Their friends mounted a little distraction and these two guys slipped into the water with their brown mattress covers over them and then slipped inside those brown mattress covers and slipped up to the side of the rocks where they huddled down looking forever like two uh, rocks themselves. They had little pipes sticking up out of, the, out of their mouths for, for air. And then they, the swimmers were counted. And when they were counted, it was revealed that there were two missing. Very, very quickly, the veterans guards started looking for where they could be. And there they were, two rocks sticking up out of the sand. They were picked up, taken back inside and 28 days in the guardhouse. And the crazy thing is they were still inside the camp when they were captured. I don't know where they thought they were going to get to, but they hadn't gotten very far. On the 8th of December, we had the Great Pillowcase Sheet and Tunnel Escape. It was in the middle of a blinding snowstorm in 1942. They tunneled through the snow um, with the white pillowcases and white sheets over them to hide their uniforms and uh, were tunneling out. So there were basically, it says in the, in the uh, telegram, there's six. But in fact, there were seven of them who tunneled out. Two were found in a nearby gully. One got all the way to Washago. One got to Stroud. And I can't figure quite out how he did that because it's kind of off the beaten track from here. And two were found on a snowplow in Barrie. But no, not riding in the cab of a snowplow truck. No, no, they were clinging to a snowplow on the front of a train. You can only imagine how absolutely frozen stiff they were, having gone all the way to Barry on the front of a train in a blinding snowstorm. For those six 28 days in the guardhouse. But what about the other one, the seventh man? Well, the seventh man was still missing. His name was Siegfried Schmidt, and he was missing, as it turned out, for four whole months. Where on earth had he escaped to? Well. He hadn't exactly. He undertook some personal plastic surgery. This gives me sort of the creeps when I think about it, but personal plastic surgery by lancing the insides of his cheeks with some sort of stuffing he stuffed into his cheeks to change his appearance. He also changed his hairline 
You can see there it's a receding sort of hairline. And where had he done all of this? Why, in the attic and in the crawl spaces of one section of the officer's quarters. When he was finally found, he was not in very good health or shape. And in actual fact, he had to be taken to hospital. I can only imagine if you tried to do your own personal uh, plastic surgery, how in fact you might not be doing very well afterwards. He was sent to another camp, not back here. The last one I'll deal with is a man who did get away, Walter Manhart, not to Germany, but he did get away completely from Camp 20, although he'd actually not really gotten to Camp 20 in the first place. While traveling to Gravenhurst to take up residence, he escaped from the train. He jumped from the train and made his way to the United States is a long detailed story. Um, despite the fact that the um, actual description of him says that he spoke some English. In fact, his English was really good. He got to the United States, the Americans aided him immediately, got him to safety in New York State. They got him a job there, he was teaching. He met another teacher, fell in love, married her. And he was not found out, his identity was not revealed until after the war. And it was he himself who revealed his identity. It's an interesting note to know that he visited the Camp 20 in 1991, I guess, sort of to see what he'd missed. By 1944, an attempt was made to categorize prisoners. They had to make some decisions about how they were going to get some of these prisoners dealt with as it became clearer and clearer that the Allies might be going to win this war. Not completely clear, but Attempts were then made to categorize them in, in the hopes of perhaps indoctrinating them here in, in Canada, or maybe for purposes of simply organizing their repatriation when it would come. They were identified basically by the intensity of their Nazi beliefs. So they were categorized as black, meaning hardline Nazis, gray, meaning pro-Germany, and perhaps loyal to Hitler, but not fanatical, and white, loyal to Germany, but not Nazis per se, probably conscripted men. Those who were judged to be moderate were often victimized by the hardline Nazis in various other camps. In Medicine Hat, for example, two of them were actually murdered uh, by their Nazi fellow prisoners uh, for their weakness, the weakness of their beliefs. Many of the POWs requested transfers away from hardliners uh, hoping to leave all the rotten apples in one basket. So a decision was made, in fact, to bring all of the troublemakers, the frequent flyers and the hardline Nazis to one camp. And that one camp was in Gravenhurst, Camp 20. And here they could then not prey on moderates. Camp 20 became labeled black or hardline Nazi, and things became very much tougher, both for the veterans, guards, and for um, just generally for life in the camp. As the war in Europe came to an end at last, it was coming to an end for everyone except POWs. In fact, it was clear that a mass repatriation of soldiers, POWs, refugees, would have to take place across Europe and North America. Logistics were going to be a nightmare especially in countries that were reduced to rubble as they were in Europe. In Canada, the decision had to be made who should go first. Well, it was clear. First, Allied soldiers would get all of the transportation that they needed to get them home from Europe or to get them to the Pacific Theater if they hadn't served long enough. Refugees would be repatriated to their new homes. Internees, and we know the sad stories of that, would be released and transported to their previous locations although they had nothing left when they got there. German POWs would be last, and when they left, they would not be going home. POWs, especially those that were not so hardline, the moderates, would in fact be sent to England initially, not to Germany, to help with the massive reconstruction work, um, efforts and all of the farm work that had to be done because the people in England and Holland and the rest of Europe were, were starving to death. So in fact, they needed to get uh, farms uh, under, um, under cultivation, they needed to get crops um, being sowed and, and harvested and so on. 
a whole lot of POWs, 6,000 of them, asked if they could stay in Canada. Permission was denied. A whole lot of people are, are very confused about this because they know that some German POWs came here. But in actual fact, or seemingly stayed here, in actual fact, they had to go back to England to do repatriation work and, and reconstruction work. Then they had to go back to Germany. Then they had to apply from Germany to Canada to come here. And we can only bet that if they had been hardline Nazis, they were probably not going to get a warm welcome back here. So in fact, it was really about 1951, 52, before they really started to come. Finally, even the hardliners were being shipped out and Camp 20 in Gravenhurst would finally close on the 29th of June, 1946. That was six years less a day from the day that it had opened. In the end, what was the legacy of Camp 20? Well, the government would sell off the property and the equipment that was there. Uh, the farm had been leased, so it reverted to its owners. The camp property, first of all, was sold to British Leyland. If any of you have ever driven an MG or a TR6 or a Triumph, um, you will know British Leyland. Uh, a hotel owned by British Leyland was almost doomed to fail. They weren't good at it, and it did fail in one year. But then the most wonderful irony of all, I do love irony. Three Toronto businessmen brought, bought the property. They did $100,000 worth of renovations on the property and produced one of the most popular resorts in Muskoka. And they had a ready-made clientele for this would be a Jewish vacationers hotel for all those people who, are, who were being barred from other Muskoka resorts. And if you know anything about the history of tourism, you know that uh, Jewish vacationers were barred from many vacation destinations, not just in Muskoka, not so much in Gravenhurst, but north of here for sure. So the entertainment would be top notch because these Toronto businessmen were connected to um, a whole lot of people. The dance bands were wonderful. The people came from all over to dine and dance at the Gateway Hotel. And in fact, a whole lot of people who would not have wanted to dine and dance with Jewish vacationers in their own hotel were quite happy to come here and do so. The connections to the entertainment scene in Toronto brought in great entertainers and orchestras. Mo Kaufman and Dave Broadfoot, among many others, moved up the entertainment ladder by starting out here. The scene on the lawn that you see here on the left-hand side is a volleyball game being played with, by Jewish hotel guests. It has striking similarities to photos of POWs in that very same spot playing tennis. The irony is marvelous. But this particular camp did not experience the kind of anti-feelings <laughs> anti for anyone. Um, in fact, everyone was welcome, not just Jewish vacationers. So Archie Moore came here to train for a heavyweight bout. An irony of ironies, former Nazi prisoners brought their families here. Just to see where they had been for six long years. The woman who's standing in the foreground of the picture here with a little boy sitting on the chair are actually the wife and son of former Nazi prisoner War Werner Hirschman. Some former POWs met up here on tours from Germany as well. But the property was very old by now and the Jewish vacationers wanted to be accepted in all mainstream hotels and resorts, not segregated in a, in a resort that was said to be only for them. So they wanted integration to happen and it gradually did. The land would be sold by Irving Ungerman, one of the three um, uh, businessmen. He was a, 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 a fights uh, promoter, as you would know, and, and also a businessman in Toronto. He sold the, the land for development, but in fact kept a strip of land, the one that was closest all the way along to the lake for the people of Gravenhurst to make it a park. A series of building demolitions and fires meant that much of the old empty camp was gone pretty quickly. They got rid of all the um, uh, pieces of buildings. They were afraid people would fall and be, the town would be sued if they were tripping over it. And in its place, a subdivision came to, to life. Um, and now kids, my own included at the time, 
uh, swim from May 24th to Thanksgiving at a place called The Rocks, which is right on the coast or on the shore of Lake Muskoka. People stroll through the property, stop to enjoy the views of Lake Muskoka. It's truly beautiful. And there are a couple of picnic tables where people can, can stop and have a picnic lunch, or there are park benches where they can sit as well. This rocky outcrop is part of the um, prisoner of war camp. Once upon a time, there was a flagpole here, and a Union Jack fluttered from the flag flagpole right on top of that rocky outcrop. The story is told of the ships, and you can see them way up there at the top of the photo. You can actually see the Seguin and the new uh, replica Winona up there. Well, when the um, uh, ships were, were sailing, the, the steamships were sailing by, uh, when they got to the point where the flagpole was opposite them, uh, the man who was playing the piano for entertainment or the orchestra on board would give a signal and all the passengers would stand and sing at the tops of their lungs while the steamship slowed down. There will always be in England, uh, rule Britannia, God save the queen. And of course, if you ask the German of prisoners of war, they never heard it. Lawrence Street on the right in your photograph is labeled. That's the street that led to the camp. You can see what's there now as subdivision. Access to the present day parkland can be found at the foot of Lawrence Street near the water. Today, a new generation of visitors is coming. This man is the son of one of the prisoners of war who was at Gravenhurst for six years. Uh, he came after a year of correspondence between myself and, and him. He brought his daughter who had just graduated from high school in Germany in Hanover. And they came and spent a week in Gravenhurst and he tried to put to rest, I think, some of the ghosts that had haunted his father, who had felt uh, humiliated by having been a prisoner of war for six years. So it was very enjoyable spending time with Eckert and his daughter. Um, he was trying to understand, I think, what his father had lived through. Ultimately, in the end, there are some things, I suppose, that we can learn from all of this. One of the things I'll just mention is Cecil Porter, one of the members of Gravenhurst Archives at the time, now deceased, unfortunately, wrote two books called The Gilded Cage, the first one in 1993, the second one, um, I believe, was in 2004, but I may be a little bit out on that, it might be 2011. Anyway, the first one was a, a, a wonderful account of The Gilded Cage and, and how it, it functioned. The second one was updated by all of the correspondence he had with prisoners of war in Germany who spoke English and could write. And so we have 17 binders of, of his correspondence, his notes and things that he learned uh, enough to update. Both of those books, unfortunately, after multiple printings of both of them are now out of date. You can occasionally find them in an antique shop or you can occasionally find them online, but they want an awful lot of money for them. This is a fish tank that was bought by, or was bought by the prisoners of war. Those, those are the guys in the top left. They've rebuilt it now near the opening to uh, the parkland that I've talked about along the water. But unfortunately, it's now filled with fallen leaves. That fire hydrant would be the only lasting remnant of all the things that had been there on that property. The Minnewaska Hotel, the Minnewaska Sanatorium, the Calador Sanatorium, the Calador Hospital, uh, German Prisoner of War Camp 20, Leyland Holiday Resort, Gateway Hotel, Camp Aviv. And since it was lifted from the ground by someone, now it too is gone. I'm hoping that you may have some questions, which I will be more than happy to attempt to answer if you have. Judy, thank you so much. That was a fascinating discussion. Um, absolutely incredible to learn that something like that was so close to our own. <laughs> um, so yeah, as Judy said, if you have any questions at all, please uh, pose them in the Q&A. Um, I did notice we have one already there. Um, Doug tells uh, an interesting story about um, learning about the camp from his grandmother. And he says one of her stories 
um, that she often mentioned was that there was choral singing that occurred at the camp. And the word was that the singing uh, was used to be uh, as a cover for noises created by. <laughs> um, and he wonders if there's any corroboration of this in the records. Um, I've not read anything specifically to that um, end, but I wouldn't be surprised at all. There wasn't a lot of digging. Um, Gravenhurst is built on two things, on sand in some places and on rock in others. And the camp was built largely on rock. Digging was not a fun occupation because even if you got a start in sand, you were likely to run up against rock before you ever got underneath the, the fence. There wasn't a lot of digging. So as I, you saw the different methods that were used to escape, I think people had had some frustrations with their digging. But yes, the singing actually was also reviewed by a few people who said it was absolutely phenomenal. You know, the sound of it was beautiful. That's great. Thank you uh, to Doug and Vicky for that. Uh, Deanne asks, um, there must have been resentment toward the officers from the townspeople. Do you know of any attempts to cause trouble with officers due to this? And what was the general relationship between communities and the camps? It's interesting because I think when it started out, you heard me say how resentful they must have been and standing along the side of the street, hissing at them coming down the street. And imagine what it felt like when, when they, hit the, they hit the town the first time. People didn't, well, people who were related to the people who'd worked on the camp, transforming it from a sanatorium to a camp, knew they were coming. But there were all those other people who maybe hadn't had a conversation with anyone and suddenly found themselves on the main street watching a whole group of Nazi soldiers walking by them, many of them in tatters of uniform. It would have been shocking and disheartening and saddening and scary as heck. Um, I think it went from there to being better than that. Um, there was a lot of interaction through the, the, the veterans guards, but also because they had parole, there was a lot of interaction between people, but we didn't have the nasty sorts of things that happened in some camps. Up north at Espanola, there was a camp and there were girls there who <laughs> found some of those POWs who were working in the forests of, of, of Espanola, very, very handsome indeed and all their young men were gone. Um, and so there were little relationships that sprang up and so on. We didn't have much of that here. There was a little bit of it, but very, very little. They just didn't get an opportunity. And on top of that, these were officers. Most of them were too smart to, to sort of get involved or try to get involved with girls. I think generally speaking, by the end of the war, there'd been a thought off sort of relationship where People basically did a let live and let live kind of thing to the point where Gravenhurst High School hosted the track and field competitions for uh, Gravenhurst, Bracebridge and Huntsville at the prisoner of war camp at the farm. Um, they actually made an application to the, um, the camp commandant who would have to go to the log and fear and so on. But generally speaking, yeah, they, they actually held their, their track and field meet there. Um, there wasn't as much fear. There was a lot of fascination. Young boys particularly found the whole thing just fascinating. Couldn't wait to get a hold of, of things. Um, they, they made a lot of things that they sold to people in the town. They, they made um, ships and bottles to some degree, but mostly they were more like... Um, those were the, the guys who were from the, the Navy. Um, but mostly they made um, oh little little things that they could make out of scraps of wood and people bought them and and, uh, and cherished them, I think, because they were handmade and very nicely done. Some artwork, beautiful artwork from some of them. Yeah. Great. We actually have a bunch of questions coming in here. Um, so many, I don't think we're going to get to all of them. <laughs> I'll, I'll yeah. Select a, a few here. Um, Sheila asks, how many of these POW camps were in Canada? 27. Perfect. There were 27 right across the country. Some were huge. The ones out in Alberta were enormous. They had like more than more than 2000, you know, multiple people. And that's where some of those murders took place because they had all the ranks in one camp. And that didn't work out well at all. 
we were lucky in a sense that we had just officers here. Um, and actually a clarifying point from Tom, do you know how many were in Ontario specifically? I think there were 10 in Ontario. Um, there was one in Bowmanville, uh, which was became sort of infamous, famous, infamous. There were riots there. Um, and then there were a bunch in Northern Ontario where they could do um, logging and that sort of thing. So there were, they were, some of them were placed strategically to sort of help get some work done. And then there were others that were, and some of them were very short lived, like they would be open for two or three years. That was it. Yeah. Ours was one of the few that was six years. Okay. Um, we have uh, Janet asking, are there records of civilian staff who worked at the camp? And if so, where would they be located? No, generally speaking, there were no civilians. I mean, there were civilians who worked to set up the camp, chance, transform it from um, the um, sanatorium. But once it was actually operating as a prisoner of war camp, no, generally speaking, there were no civilians. There were deliveries made by civilians to the camp, but everybody in the camp was either a member of the Veterans Guard or a member of the um, Canadian military or the German military. They were, they were all military people. Okay. Um, I'm gonna take uh, two more here. Um, we have one question asking, can you provide any detail about the two POWs who died at Camp 20? Do you know anything about that? Yeah, one of them actually uh, didn't die at Camp 20, but was brought here for burial initially. Uh, there were two of them. Um, I have a slide, actually. Uh, one of the prisoners made the most beautiful, oh, maybe 10 foot tall um, wooden structures that were marking the graves. They were absolutely beautiful. One of them died in surgery in Toronto. He was the guy from this camp here, I believe. He died under surgery. I, I don't know whether he had an, a, an ulcer or appendicitis or what it was, but he had surgery and he died. And the other fellow was died of sickness and was brought here at, from one of the camps to be buried because we had a space at the back of our big cemetery here, Mickle Cemetery. About 1970, all prisoners of war who had died in Canada, who were Germans, uh, were taken to Kitchener and they were all buried in one graveyard in Kitchener, um, in one area of that graveyard. So they're all buried there now. And those two big wooden monuments were moved to Kitchener as well. Okay, and uh, that actually answers William's question as well, I believe, so that's great. Um, and the last question from Caitlin, the remains of the camp, were they bulldozed into the water? No. Um, the remains of the camp, by and large, well, not that I know of. I mean, they, they could have been, I suppose. But there were, there were weird kinds of remains, if you like. There were a bunch of fires out there. Once the camp was closed and, and, and the hotel had closed and everything else had closed there, um, you had these big empty buildings. And of course, you had, you had sometimes you had people who came along and tried to sort of sleep there, you know, and they were wandering around. And so there were fires set that way. Kids set fires there and so on. So the rubble and whatnot would be taken and whatever was done with rubble in those days would be done with the rubble. I don't imagine that they plowed it in. I think it would have been difficult to do that from where the buildings were by, you know, connection to the to the edge of the lake. I can certainly try to find that out, but I, I don't think so. I think it was just all hauled away, you know, gradually over time. Fascinating. Um, on top of the questions, Judy, we had a number of comments thanking you for your, your time and your expertise this evening. Um, You're welcome. So thank you, everyone. Um, with that, we're gonna pass it off to uh, Janet Houston, who is going to wrap up the evening for us. So Janet, over to you. Thank you, Lindsay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I just have to say that I've heard this talk from Judy before, and she really is a researcher's researcher because <laughs> she does add detail, I believe, and make things more interesting each time. Uh, so on behalf of OMA and the History Committee, many, many thanks, Judy, so fascinating. I also want to thank on behalf of History Committee, everyone who attended. It's uh, great to have you supporting our speaker series. And we appreciate very much 
you are filling out the post-event surveys. Those are very important to our planning and to know how we're doing and whether we're presenting things that are of interest. The winner of the first prize for, um, we, we've decided to award prizes. That person was picked after last time and has been or will be contacted by email. And tonight's random winner of an OMA mug will soon be chosen as well. So remember please to do those surveys for us. Also, just to be a bit quick about it, although I'm not usually very quick at all at anything, I would just say in May, we have a terrific speaker again, um, Charlie Ellens. And he is going to tell us about the history of the Trent Severn Waterway. It's a national historic site. It's one of the five, inter five finest interconnected systems of water navigation in the world. So that will be a very fascinating May presentation. Then we are taking the summer off to refresh and research. And then in September, we're having local speaker, Lori Oshevsky of Home Children Canada. And she's presenting a talk, Breaking the Silence. Lori was dealt a bit of a shock when her mother revealed to her that she had actually been a, uh, a migrant child, part of the home children program um, and revealed quite late that information to her family. So between 1869 and 1948, over a hundred thousand children were sent from the UK to Canada. They were called orphans, but really they just for some reason or another could not be brought up by their own families. So very, very sad, but really worth knowing. Once more, Judy, thank you so much. You're absolutely awesome. I've enjoyed every second of your presentation. It's still ringing in my ears and I took <laughs> copious notes. So thank you and good night to everyone from me. Please fill in your surveys. Thank you.